Uh, hello, uh, welcome to this uh, session. Uh, today we're going to uh, consider uh, sensor selection and uh, integration. In the previous chapter, we considered how we, uh, we can put the different uh, components uh, together to uh, set up a wireless sensor node. We've emphasized that the selection of a particular component depends on the uh, trade-off we wish to achieve uh, between, on the one hand, the performance of the sensor node and uh, the cost of the sensor node on the other. Um, this cost comes in the form of um, space, in the form of uh, power consumption, in the form of cost, and also in the form of the ease with which the sensor node can be uh, deployed, installed, and maintained. Uh, we have seen the, the different subsystems of a wireless sensor node, uh, beginning uh, from a wireless, um, the sensing subsystem, uh, the processing subsystem, and uh, communication uh, subsystem. Uh, and how these subsystems can be put together or interconnected with one another using uh, different types of um, communication buses. Today, we are going to see how we can measurably qualify uh, the quality of a sensor because the quality of information we can extract from a physical uh, environment depends on the quality of the sensor and how well uh, the sensor picks up some aspects of the physical environment. Uh, I have organized this uh, talk as follows. We're going, broadly speaking, the slides will be divided into two building blocks. The first one on the uh, selection of a sensor and the second on the integration of the sensor. Um, in the selection process, we're going to consider different types of uh, measurable metrics, including accuracy, sensitivity, zero crossing, reproducibility, span, stability, resolution, and uh, selectivity and response time. Uh, when it comes to uh, sensor integration, we're going to consider uh, self-heating, dead volume, uh, radiation from external sources uh, in the form of uh, you know, equipment which emits uh, uh, radiation as well as uh, the radiation coming from the sun. Uh, in our lecture on uh, a wireless sensor uh, node, uh, I mentioned about the four uh, Aristotelian uh, causes, if you remember. The first cause is uh, the material cause. The second cause is the goal. The third cause was the formal or the design. And the fourth was the um, agent uh, cause. These four causes are required to bring a certain uh, object into existence. Uh, as far as the material is concerned for uh, building a sensor, uh, we can build a sensor in a different way. But in general, we can uh, build a sensor from uh, electrical equipment, electrical uh, material. Uh, so we have electrical sensors, uh, we have thermocouples, uh, which transform heat energy to electrical energy. So when it comes to uh, sensing temperature, uh, we can use a uh, thermocouple. Uh, remember, there is also a, a close relationship between pressure and temperature, given uh, a constant uh, volume. So we can also use thermocouple indirectly to measure uh, pressure. Uh, we have ultrasonic sensors which uh, capture ultrasonic uh, signal coming from different types of uh, sources. Uh, during active volcano, for example, we have seen how the um, collision of the slab uh, beneath the earth's uh, 
uh, munt uh, can produce vibration and this vibration uh, manifests itself in the form of ultrasonic uh, signal. Uh, also, uh, there are uh, different uh, sources, physical sources, uh, which produce ultrasonic signals. So we, we can use ultrasound uh, sensors. Or we can also generate the ultrasonic sensors ourselves, emit them into a process or into a, a material, and then we analyze the reflection or absorption of these ultrasonic sensors, uh, so sonic uh, signals uh, to reason about uh, pressure, to reason about uh, distribution of uh, tissues, for example, in the human body. Uh, we have optical signals where uh, you know heated objects can emit uh, infrared uh, radiation and optical signals can interact uh, sorry optical sensors can interact with this uh, 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 signals to sense their presence and the magnitude of uh, their presence uh, also we have magnetic sensors a combination of all these can be used to uh, pick up or sense different types of physical processes and physical uh, materials. For example, the, the, the utilization of this material can have different goals in the form of the final sensors. Here I have listed different types of uh, sensors. Uh, thermoelectric sensors we have uh, which transform uh, heat energy into electric energy, photoelectric sensors, light energy to um, electric energy, photomagnetic sensors transform uh, light into uh, magnetic properties and so on. So we have a wide variety uh, of uh, sensors which we can build uh, by properly choosing the input-output uh, relationship. Which of these sensors are uh, important, which of them are um, reliable. It all depends on the, the, the trade off we want to uh, make, as I said, in the form of space, performance, cost, and uh, so on. And also, uh, it depends on the, mat the process or the, 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 the physical environment where we want to uh, embed the sensors. Uh, one thing I wish uh, to comment about is magnetic sensors can easily be affected by external uh, magnetic fields, unfortunately. So they are very um, sensitive and they require a proper shielding to exclude undesirable uh, magnetic sources. So care must be taken uh, when uh, choosing a magnetic sensor for a uh, specific application. Uh, Capacitive sensors are extremely used because of their simple construction. Uh, they essentially uh, transform the dielectric material of the, the process we want to interface. Uh, by so doing, they uh, change the capacitance of a capacitor. Uh, they have a wide range of uh, application. They are relatively cheap and they can be quite uh, reliable. Okay, before we uh, delve deep into the uh, selection or the qualification process of uh, a sensor, we have to agree what we mean by uh, a sensor. Uh, essentially here I have plotted four different types of uh, component which make up what we call a sensor. So a sensor is not really a single uh, object or a single uh, uh, component. It is a collection of uh, components. Uh, here, the, the, the blue uh, object uh, depicts uh, a sensing element. The, the task of this element is to transform some form of energy into uh, electric energy. Uh, so for example, if we have a photodiode, it changes light into electric energy. A phototransistor likewise changes light energy into um, electric energy. A thermocouple changes uh, heat energy into electric energy and so on. So the, the assignment of a sensing element is the, the transformation. 
in some literature, uh, this element is depicted as transducer. So it's not called a sensing element, but a transducer because it transforms one form of energy to uh, another form of energy. It's normally the magnitude of the output of a sensing element or a transducer is very, very small in, in millivolt uh, or even in microvolt um, range. So this has to be first amplified. So the preamplifier here picks up this small signal and uh, brings to brings brings it into an appreciable uh, magnitude so that we can process uh, the signal. The conditioning circuit you see here has uh, multiple application, but the final aim is to prepare the um, the desirable signal, which we call a measurement, uh, into a form that it is possible to um, to interpret, to, to meaningfully uh, interpret it. Uh, that means the output of a conditioning circuit often is. Uh, in the in the state where we can extract meaning or reason about the external environment or the physical uh, environment. Finally, we have also uh, uh, an amplifier. The, the the aim of which is again to amplify the magnitude of the signal without changing the the characteristic of the signal. Uh, if we uh, want to see more specifically about the conditioning circuit here, we are talking about uh, filtering the undesirable signal uh, or uh, mixing the, the output of multiple sensing element in, in a meaningful way, such that you know the superposition uh, is uh, more meaningful, more strong, or more robust than the, the signal coming from individual um, sources or it, it could also mean uh, uh, narrowing the, 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 the spectrum of the uh, incoming signal to a, a range where interesting events can be uh, looked into. So this all together build up um, a sensor. So where is the quality of a sensor as a whole. So the quality of a sensor depends on the sensing element, of course, because the, uh, the its sensitivity, its selectivity, and so on. Response time are important. Uh, so when sometimes we are talking specifically about the sensing element, but sometimes we are also talking about the whole system. For example, the the quality of the preamplifier. Uh, determines the sensitivity of the entire signal because some amplifier may not accept as input, you know, very small uh, signal magnitudes. Uh, the conditioning circuit again is very, very essential to reject all the spurious signals and admit only the signal which uh, is interesting for us. So the selectivity of the conditioning circuit is an essential aspect. So when we talk about quality of a sensor, we might be talking indirectly about the quality of the conditioning circuit. Likewise, the final amplifier, the quality of the final amplifier also uh, determines, especially if it has a tuning circuit, uh, determine the quality of the, the sensor as a whole. So sometimes from the context, it is easier to understand what we are referring to when we are referring about the quality of a sensor. Sometimes it is not, so we have to uh, speak in explicit uh, terms what we mean about, uh, what we mean by the quality of uh, a sensor, whether this refers to the sensing element or to all the other uh, elements. Uh, to begin with, here I have plotted three different types of, uh, the outputs of three different types of sensors. Uh, when these are three temperature sensors, we have sampled these three temperature sensors uh, for one second at a very, very high sampling rate at a one kilo hertz rate. That means we have uh, 10,000, uh, so, sorry, we have, yes, 10,000 uh, samples for 10 seconds. 
So this signal, the, 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 the outputs of these three different sensors uh, are plotted here. When the measurement was conditioned to be zero degrees Celsius. So essentially when the, the, the measurement is zero degrees Celsius, we expect the sensor to output zero, zero volt. But uh, what we see here, the outputs are not zero volt, but sometimes they are of course zero volts, but sometimes they vary from these uh, magnitudes. This essentially uh, speaks three different types of uh, aspects which, we, uh, which I wish to uh, discuss with you. If you consider the first two, on average, the output of these two sensors is zero, zero volt. So when the measurement is zero, the output is also zero, and that is what we expect. But if we consider the, the variance of uh, these samples, uh, of course, the variance is not uh, zero. Here, the variance is uh, four millivolt, and here the variance was uh, 64 millivolt. So you can see that even when there is absolutely no measurement to sense, physical sensors can output some, some voltage sometimes minus millivolts, sometimes plus millivolts. Where does this output come from? Maybe because of the uh, random motion of electron, uh, electrons in the uh, sensing element itself, or the random motion of the, the uh, uh, electron in the tuning circuit of the different uh, amplifiers. And if we have oscillators, there, there are also good sources of uh, noise. So when we speak about these two sensors, we say that they measure, the, you know, their measurement or their outputs most of the time agrees with the, uh, with the real output, with the real measurement. Most of the time, or on average, they agree with the physical wordlet or they reflect the physical wordlet uh, appropriately, but most of the time but they also contain some error. This sensor, on the other hand, the one with the uh, coral color, uh, the, the output on average is not zero volt. The output is about five millivolt, where we expect zero millivolt to be the, uh, to be the case. But the samples are rather, similar. The, the difference between the samples is not that much. For example, it's not like the, 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 the blue one. The, the, in the blue one, the samples are quite dissimilar with, with each other, with the variance of 64. The samples of this sensor and the samples of these sensors are really similar. So in terms of the quality, these two sensors, the, 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 the black sensor and the coral sensor, are not much different. Here, we say we need some calibration. With a, a proper calibration, it is possible to uh, make the output of the sensor reflect the real world. But here, no matter what type of calibrations you make, the signal, the, the, the samples are quite dissimilar. So when we speak about these two sensors, the first two sensors, we say that they are accurate. Because on average, their output agrees with the real world. Their output is close to the real world. When we speak about the two sensors, this one and this one, the two extreme sensors on the other hand, we say that they are precise. They are consistent in their output. So here it is important to differentiate between precision and accuracy. 
Precision refers to the consistency of a sensor in its observation of one and the same environment. When it comes to accuracy, on the other hand, we refer to the nearness of the value of a sensor to a true value. So here, on average, the two sensors are accurate as far as their average output being in alignment with the real environment or the real value of the measurement. When it comes to the black and the coral, we speak about precision because the two sensors are consistent when we take repeated measurement using these two sensors. So we begin with accuracy, formally defining accuracy. The accuracy of a sensor is a measure of its nearness or the out, its output to a true value. Most of the time, the true value is not known. There is absolutely no sensor on us that tells you with 100% accuracy what the value of a certain measurement is. There is no temperature sensor which uh, can measure with 100% accuracy the temperature of this room. There is no, absolutely no sensor, no measurement which, which tells you how high I am or how much I weigh. The true value is always hidden. Even at a quantum level, our knowledge of the real world is limited by Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So we are utterly helpless when it comes to measuring a certain uh, phenomenon of interest with 100% accuracy, we can't. But we can also use more complex more expensive devices as a reference and then measure all the accuracy of other sensors in terms of this reference signal. So when we speak about true value, remember we meant by the value measured by a reference sensor or a reference measurement. Okay. So accuracy means the nearness of the outputs of a sensor to a true value or to a value measured by a reference sensor or a reference a measurement. Interestingly, the accuracy of a sensor changes at the magnitude at the magnitude of the measurement changes it is not a static quantity we can optimize a sensor to measure a certain range more accurately than other ranges so here i have plotted here for example this is the temperature in degree sensors at the x axis and the output of a sensor in millivolt along the y axis and in most cases, the dissimilarity between the samples does not stay the same when we change the, the, the temperature. And most factors try to optimize the accuracy of a sensor for a particular range of values. You have to know this one. So when we speak about the accuracy of a sensor, generally we speak in the, in, in the form of uh, average. For example, we measure the accuracy of the sensor between 0 and 5 degrees Celsius, between 5 and 10 degrees Celsius, between five, uh, 10 and 15, and so on, and then add the, the accuracies and then again average them. And then we say that the average is about 1%. That means the error is about 1%. 
Another important aspect is the sensitivity of a sensor. The sensitivity simply means the smallest value that can be picked up by a sensor. What is the smallest, for example, amount of temperature a thermometer can pick up? Here, it is important to remember the big picture I uh, uh, tried to draw in the beginning. When it comes to the sensitivity of a sensing element, we are speaking about you know, the smallest value the, the, the sensing element can sense. But the sensor itself, the sensing element may be highly sensitive, but the preamplifier may not be highly sensitive. Or the analog to digital converter may not be highly sensitive enough to pick up this small signal. So even if the sensing element is highly accurate, it may be the case that all the other subsequent uh, components may be not so sensitive uh, to go along with the sensing element. So sensitivity, when it refers to the entire sensor, is not necessarily the quality of the sensing element. Alone, I mean. It may refer to the quality of the preamplifier or the conditioning circuit or the analog to digital converter. Another interesting aspect is the zero offset. In the beginning, I have told you, we, we set the measure run to be zero and then measured the output and we picked up some, some uh, millivolt, as you have seen. We try to compare the three different um, sensors accordingly. So a zero offset simply means the value that can be picked up by a sensor when the, there is absolutely no measurement or when the measurement should be measured zero. Most of the time to uh, measure the uh, zero offset, we use the probability distribution or the probability density uh, function. So here, for example, we have uh, used, uh, plotted the uh, probability density functions of the first two sensors. So in the first sensor, the, uh, the output of the sensor varied between minus four and four. Uh, and most of the samples were uh, in the range of zero or uh, in the neighborhoods, uh, in the neighborhood of zero. So with a very high probability, if you take samples at any given time uh, using this sensor, when the measurement is zero, you will be picked with a high probability values which are near zero. But occasionally you can measure other values uh, ranging uh, between minus four and four. And I'll, for the second sensor, on the other hand, you see that we could uh, measure from minus 15 to positive 15 millivolt. Again, on average, the, the, uh, the sensor will also measure zero millivolt. But here, the, 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 the probability of measuring zero millivolt is around 0 0.1, whereas here it is around 0 0.5 around 0 0.5 millivolt, uh, sorry, 0 0.5 uh, probability. Here, with a high probability, we measure zero compared to this one. Another uh, indication of the quality of a sensor is how broad this, uh, this curve is. The broader the curve, the more dissimilar are the samples, the less reliable is the sensor. The narrower the curve, the more similar the samples are and the more reliable the sensor is. So the, the curve of zero offset indicates how reliable a sensor is. Another important aspect here is uh, reproducibility. We have indirectly uh, treated this subject. Reproducibility means under the same Operation, operating condition. If we take sample from the sensor without changing the, 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 the measurement, how consistent are the output samples of the sensor? For example, we fix the, the measurement to be zero degree centigrade or 20 degree centigrade 
and then we take repeated samples without changing the external condition and see how the sensor could reproduce the samples. So reproducibility tells us the consistency or the precision of a sensor. How predictable a sensor is in terms of measuring one in the same uh, physical uh, process. But remember, a sensor may be precise a sensor may have high degree of reproducibility, but this does not necessarily mean it's a good sensor. For example, if the sensor is defect, let's say the output is always 10 millivolt for whatever reason. So if you take 10,000 10, samples, you'll always measure 10 millivolt. This does not tell, necessarily tell you that the sensor is accurate or the sensor is reliable. It just tells you how consistent is a sensor. Uh, specifically, we're going to see in, uh, shortly about uh, hysteresis. Uh, magnetic sensors are extremely sensitive and uh, they tend not to be reproducible because they always remember that they have some memory uh, quality in them that things tend to add or subtract. So the the uh, the relationship between output and uh, input is not memoryless. This type of sensors tend to be uh, not good in terms of reproducibility. Thermocouple sensors, piezoelectric sensors, you know, elastic sensors have issues with reproducibility. Uh, another important aspect is span. Span simply means the difference between the maximum uh, uh, amount and the minimum amount a temperature uh, measures. Uh, sorry, not a temperature, but a sensor measures. The difference between the maximum amount and the minimum amount. Again, when we speak about the span, we have to uh, be very careful. If we assume there is a linear relationship between the input and the output, the, the, the quality of this linear relationship, especially the slope, changes towards the um, opposite extremes. Here, for example, in this figure, you can see that the ideal was this line, a relationship between the input and the output. But in reality, what we get is this type of relationship. So this is a linear relationship. Here also you can see a linear relationship. Here also you can see kind of linear relationship, but the quality of the different regions is not the same. So sometimes we just set a limit by saying, okay, this is the maximum in the positive direction the sensor can measure, and this is the minimum the sensor can measure in the opposite direction and we just reject the outputs of all, all the others. So span speaks or uh, uh, refers to the relationship, the, the, a good relationship or an acceptable relationship between the, the output and the, uh, the input, the, between the measurement and the, the, the output of a sensor in a certain acceptable range. Uh, more specifically here, uh, I have plotted the transfer function. The transfer function means the ratio of the output to the input. And uh, we expect that in a good relationship, the, the transfer function has some linear or uh, uh, a, a, a function that can be mapped to the, to the um, input without losing any information. It's desirable to have a, a linear relationship, but we may not always get a relationship, a linear relationship between the output and the, the input. It's okay if we have an exponential relationship. This does not matter. It's even okay if we have, uh, you know, other uh, powers of relationship, but we should always insist that the relationship between the input and the output is one to one. 
So that means for a single output, there should be only a, for a single input, there should be a single output. It, 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 it mustn't be the case that the temperature is three, volt, uh, three degrees Celsius, and sometimes we measure, let's say, three millivolt, sometimes minus three volt, and sometimes six millivolt for the same sensor. So there has to be uh, a one-to-one -one, uh, relationship. But we have seen in the beginning that for one and the same measurement, a sensor may output multiple samples, you know, multiple uh, uh, outputs. Uh, the, the more dissimilar the, the, the uh, samples of the sensors are, the less reliable is the the, the sensor. So, uh, in, in if th this black, uh, you know, the, 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 the dashed line is the ideal transfer uh, curve, the ideal transfer function here depicts a linear relationship. Uh, but in reality, the kind of uh, re relationship we get is this one. You see, it is really not a linear relationship. But we, ha we have to set a limit to the swing of this curve. So the, this curve and this curve, the two, um, the, the upper and the lower uh, uh, straight lines put a limit to the variations in sample. So when we uh, discuss about the span, we, we define the span to be this range where the transfer function is within, uh, within the two uh, extreme straight uh, lines. Uh, a typical problem with uh, magnetic sensors, uh, and in fact, uh, thermocouples and piezoelectric sensors, is that if you reduce the, the, the input, the output should also uh, change in a reverse direction uh, in a predictable and linear uh, fashion, ideally. But for magnetic sensors and thermocouples and uh, piezoelectric sensors, this may not be the case. So even if you remove the measurement, you may still uh, find uh, some output in, in, in the sensor. This is what we call hysteresis. Okay, for example, look, if we increase the sensor in this direction, in the measurement in this direction, suppose the uh, the the output we get with this curve, okay, the, or the, the the relationship between the measurement and the output when the measurement increases can be represented by this curve. But on the other hand, if you remove or reduce the magnitude of the measurement, for example, when the temperature decreases, ideally it should also follow the same curve. But this is not the case. Because now, the, 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 if we are talking about a magnetic sensor, the magnet has some uh, remnant uh, magnetic fields still aligned, even if you remove the, the, the uh, input, then this is what we get. So there are dissimilar curves, one for increasing and one for decreasing. The same is uh, can be said for sensors uh, which have elastic capacity. So if you increase uh, pressure or if you increase uh, force, the, the elasticity uh, relationship will have one, one curve. But if you reduce now the, the, the force, the uh, substance may not return back to its original um, uh, size or it may not return to its original size in time. It may take some time to return back to the original size. This effect is what we call uh, hysteresis, and it is a, a not a desirable uh, quality because it does not reflect the quality of the measure on, um, outside. So a good sensing system is one which does not absolutely have a hysteresis effect. Okay, uh, another uh, uh, aspect or uh, two additional aspects uh, I wish to uh, address uh, are um, selectivity and uh, resolution. Uh, resolution simply means change. So the minimum change 
a sensor can pick is what we regard as its uh, resolution in terms of millivolt. The minimum change, remember, uh, we are not talking here about sensitivity. Sensitivity is the minimum, vol the minimum uh, measurement, the minimum input it needs to pick up the measurement. But uh, um, resolution simply means the minimum change required to reflect a minimum change in the output. Most of the time, this change is affected by, unfortunately, uh, the analog to digital converter because the analog to digital converter, if you remember, introduces a quantization error. So if this change is not big enough, the, uh, for example, we have two discrete level, let's say one and two. The analog to digital converter will map any values between these two, either to two or to one. For example, the true measurement, let's say, is 1.2 volt. This would be taken as one volt when the analog digital converter changes the signal to, an, uh, to digital signal. If, for example, the measurement has moved now to 1.4, still the analog, digital, uh, analog to digital converter may insist that the output is one volt because 1.4 will be mapped. Uh, to, to one. The on may move to 1.5 volt. In this case, the uh, analog to digital converter may decide either for two volt or to one volt because 1.5 is just in the middle. So this resolution, uh, you know, quantization uh, error or quantization failure may damage the resolution of the sensor. The minimum amount in the change of the measurement uh, that can be picked up by the sensor. Selectivity, on the other hand, is the capacity, mostly not only the sensing subsystem, but the conditioning subsystem to reject all the other undesirable signals, all the other spurious signal, and pick up the desirable signal. This quality of a sensor is what we uh, refer as the selectivity of the sensor. We refer to the, the selectivity of the sensor. Okay, finally, the response time. This is especially uh, interesting for temperature sensors, uh, pressure sensors, uh, and uh, the like. The response time simply means the time the sensor need to reach the uh, corresponding uh, output when we change the input by a magnitude of, for example, one. Okay, let's say we set the measurement to 10 degrees centigrade and then move now the temperature to one degree centigrade. The time needed by the sensor to perceive this change and come to the appropriate value the response time of the sensor. Remember, the sensor always takes some time to settle at a certain magnitude. And this settling time is what we refer to as the response time of the sensor. Oscillate, you know, uh, sensors uh, picking up uh, physical oscillations for monitoring uh, uh, bridges and uh, complex buildings. We need a, a fast response time for temperature sensors, especially if we are measuring uh, internal temperature of a body, we need high response time. A pH sensor needs some, some, some uh, you know, fast response time uh, because they don't settle to their uh, final um, output at, at once. They take uh, some, some time. So the ideal sensor, we have a constant or a flat speed of response within this operational band. So no matter if the measurement change, you, you see that there is some uh, frequency response in, in this one. If a measurement changes, let's say from 20 degrees, degrees centigrade to uh, 10 degrees centigrade in one second, so will the uh, sensor settle to the, uh, from the, uh, value corresponding to 20 to the value corresponding to uh, 10 degrees centigrade in one second. 
Mm? This uh, is uh, what we uh, refer to as the response time. Okay. Uh, so far, we have considered how the different metrics uh, needed. I just picked up uh, a handful of them, uh, which are required to qualify, quantitatively qualify uh, a sensor. Uh, in the subsequent few uh, slides, we're going to see how we, in the, after we have made our selection, how it is possible to integrate a sensor uh, into a bigger uh, system. For example, how to integrate a sensor uh, subsystem into a sensor, a sensor node. Why do we worry about this? Because the, the, the performance of a sensor can also be affected by you know the surrounding uh, components on the other hand the sensor may also affect the uh, operation of the surrounding component and the third aspect is that the sensor also occupies some space so we need to find an optimal placement strategy such that the performance of the sensor and all the other components is not affected Okay, optimal integration here takes into consideration uh, optimal placement uh, and uh, a minimization of uh, interference arising both from within and uh, without. Uh, the first important aspect we need to consider, uh, this especially affected sensors uh, which have to be shielded. Uh, for some reason, you know, magnetic sensors require some shielding because the magnetic uh, field arising from the outside world, from the Earth's magnetic field, may affect unnecessarily or imp uh, 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 improperly affect the sensor. So they need some some shielding. Uh, humidity sensors they need some shielding. Uh, pH sensors they need also some some shielding. Sensors which require shielding may also suffer from dead volume. What's a dead volume? I, I'm going to show you here uh, in a typical example. Here is the sensor, the sensor of interest here, the whole system. This is the substrate and this is the sensor. And then we use some protection housing uh, either to protect it from external radiation or from external magnetic field or from, from uh, uh, water, for example. And then we put in place this aperture so that the desired measurement can go through this uh, gateway. But the problem is that once the measurement enters uh, into the sensor this way, it may not also leave, but it has to leave. Otherwise, you know, let's take a, a typical example of light. We want to measure light. So a light enters and then it reflects back and forth and stays here. But then light has gone, as long as the measurement is concerned, let's say light is gone. So the, the sensor should sense darkness. But because of the light which is trapped in this volume, the sensor still assumes that the measurement has some light. The same can be taught of humidity. Humidity, remember, it measures wetness in the air. Relative humidity, for example, measures the relative uh, weight molecules available in, in, in the air. So if they, these molecules, after having been measured, and let's say the measurement has now changed its property, but because of the molecules which have not left the, the sensing area, still the sensor thinks that the measurement hasn't changed its value. So dead volume can affect the response time of the sensor and uh, produce some erroneous uh, output. So when it comes to integration, this is something we have to uh, take care of. Uh, another important aspect is self-heating. Sensors can be very easily affected by heat because heat is energy. Remember in the beginning we have said that the the, the function of a sensing element or a transducer is to change one form of energy to another form of energy. So heating can be considered or mistaken for 
a desirable energy coming from the physical environment. But this heat may not come from the external environment, but it might be the uh, result of internal uh, self-heating. There are so many uh, 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 sources of self-heating in a wireless sensor node. We have to address this uh, problem. The first problem of self-heating is the sensor itself. Because the sensor, remember, it, it functions, it transforms uh, some form of energy to other form of energy, and as a byproduct, heat might be produced. So the sensing element itself may produce heat. And this self-created heat may also affect the performance of the sensor itself, because it will begin to uh, interpret or transform this heat into electrical signal. Most of the commercially available sensors operate with duty cycle to avoid self-heating. So what is a duty cycle? A duty cycle is the portion of time the sensor is active. Most of the time, this is about 10%, between one and 10% of the time. So here, you can see that during this time, the sensor is active and then it's, it's switched off so that it can cool down. And then again, it's switched on, it can sense and then cool down. By operating a physical sensor with a duty cycle, it is possible to minimize self-heating. And the time, the portion of time is defined as D is equal to TA over TS plus TA, where TS plus TA is the, uh, the, the period of a cycle. Okay, so here you can see T is one period and a big portion of this period, TS is the active, uh, sorry, TA is the active time, whereas uh, a considerable portion of this, uh, a small portion of this period, sorry, a very small portion of this period, TA is when the sensor is active and a big portion of this period, TS is the time when the sensor slips or is inactive to cool down and avoid self-heating. Okay, another important uh, aspect we need to take into uh, account is self-heating coming from other components, most importantly the processor subsystem and the power subsystem as well as the radio subsystem itself because these are relatively bulky components compared to the sensing element and they do lots of operation the the power subsystem remember uh, produces power distributes power uh, and it's always active and as a result it produces heat the processing subsystem when it computes produces heat and the communication subsystem when it's active when it's sending and receiving packets it's active and produces self-heating and this heat if it reaches the sensor can affect its performance considerably so we have to find a mechanism to uh, shield the sensing element from this heat i'm going to show you uh, some of the uh, mechanisms how to how self uh, heating can affect the sensing element and how we can um, minimize this effect. For example, here the sensor, here you can see the sensor is connected with the power subsystem and the uh, microcontroller. And the, the size of the wire in this case can affect how easily heat can be transferred uh, between this uh, component. Here, instead of using these big uh, wires, it is possible now to use uh, thin wires to minimize the transfer of heat from these components to the sensing element. So instead of using thick wires, here we have uh, a case where thin wires are used to uh, connect the sensing subsystem with the uh, heat sources. Another important aspect is to actually shield the sensing subsystem using some uh, shields. 
so that you know the heat cannot be transferred uh, from the microcontroller in the, the, the power uh, directly. And here we have found uh, an outlet, a mechanism for the heat to leave the, the, the system uh, without affecting all the other components. So there has to be a mechanism, a, a, you know, a, a flow uh, for the heat to leave the, the system uh, safely. For the self-heating that is generated by the, the sensing uh, subsystem itself, here, as you can see, there is an outlet for the heat to, to leave the system. Uh, Another important aspect, of course, is when, when you uh, create an outlet for the heat to leave, you should also be careful that an external source does not find a way to release its heat uh, towards the sensing uh, subsystem. So this has to be also carefully uh, looked into. In the final analysis, we have to protect the sensing subsystem, both from the internal and the external uh, sources. Uh, so here you can see that uh, this path is blocked so that now the heat has uh, a mechanism to leave the system in the opposite uh, direction. Okay, another problem, which is really a considerable problem uh, next to self-heating is radiation. Radiation coming in the form of infrared or in the form of heat again, or radiation coming from the uh, the sun. So here you can see that a, a heated, uh, a, a heated uh, object is releasing infrared signals and this signal, especially if there is a lens effect nearby, uh, it can focus the signal and uh, affect the, uh, the sensor. Uh, this is the way infrared sensors uh, function. This is a very deliberate way of, you know, uh, magnifying the uh, the infrared signals which we wish to pick up, but this effect may also have uh, undesirable uh, output. That means it could also be the case where a, an artificial lens effect can accumulate, uh, you know, um, incoming uh, infrared signal to uh, have. Uh, an impact on a sensing element. So this can be a desirable design to uh, pick up uh, infrared uh, signals where we want to uh, use uh, an infrared signal to, to, to measure some, some uh, you know, where this can be used as a, a temperature sensor, for example, but a chance combination of different uh, components could also result in undesirable concentration of uh, infrared signal to disturb uh, the function or the operation of a sensor. Another uh, source is of course the sun. It, can, it generates a large amount of heat uh, which can be uh, received uh, in the form of infrared signal and can affect uh, a sensor. So there has to be a mechanism to shield uh, sensors from this type of uh, effects. By this, I come to the conclusion of my uh, lecture today. Uh, as a summary today, we consider two different aspects, uh, the selection of a sensor and the uh, integration of a sensor in a sensor node. Uh, when it comes to selection, we uh, consider different types of metrics to measure the, the quality of the sensors. We discussed about the difference between precision and um, accuracy. We have specially, uh, specifically uh, discussed the difficulty of uh, measuring uh, a physical uh, phenomenon with 100% accuracy. Uh, instead, we use uh, reference uh, sensors uh, to uh, measure and compare the accuracy of other uh, sensors. We uh, discussed about uh, span, we discussed about zero uh, uh, offset uh, voltage, we discussed about uh, selectivity and uh, sensitivity, uh, reproducibility and uh, resolution. 
And when it comes to uh, integrating a sensor, uh, we focused on making sure that the uh, operation of a sensor is not influenced by interference arising both from a, a external sources and internal sources uh, in the form of uh, heat. Uh, thank you for listening. Uh, by this, I come to the uh, conclusion of uh, my, my talk.